Good morning again. Thank you for that beautiful testimony, Alice. That was, that was beautiful. Uh, you see me kind of limp up here, and uh, I feel odd doing that at a healing conference. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to say I'm very healthy. Uh, I'm just getting older, and the parts are wearing out. It's the used car syndrome. And it, it's interesting. I, I never read anything at all in the healing literature about aging. Nothing. Now, the good thing about it is nobody's written anything. <laughs> and we can investigate. Like, uh, I've, I've received some real miracles, I think. Like, uh, my eyesight is as good as it's ever been. In fact, it's better than it was 30 years ago. Uh, my hearing is perfect. Things like that. The, the only thing is that the... Uh, I used to love to run and play tennis, and play baseball and everything. And uh, the, the joints just got worn out, you know. And uh, I, I think we could probably pray that there, there's something that could be put in there. You know? God's glucosamine or something that'll take care of that. So I'd just like to say that. I'm very aware, and of course our staff and our wonderful prayer ministers and friends are aware of that, and they pray for me, which is great. It keeps me going. Uh, in our own ministry, uh, uh, Judith is my successor. She's 23 years younger, and she, she's my successor, so I'm uh, chairman emeritus, <laughs> all of that, and keeper of the vision. Isn't that a great title? <laughs> keeper of the vision. So, in some sense, I'm retired, but I'm not really retired. And I'd like to say something, too, by way of local color. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the biggest Indian massacre in Kentucky history is known as the McNutt defeat. And Judith's ancestors did it. <laughs> she, she's uh, about half Cherokee Indian, and uh, this was 1786. There was a party coming through from Virginia of settlers. Uh, 1786, that's early, going through the Boonesboro Trace and the Cumberland Gap. And um, they were Presbyterian, I guess, vague, vaguely Christian. But they came to this place. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> oh, well. They, they came to this place in the moonlight, which is a flat rock. So they decide, this is a good place. There are about 60 in the party. There are about 60 in the... So they, they stopped, and they forgot to set out the guards and stuff like that. Uh, they thought it would be chicken to set out guards. So they started playing cards. And uh, while they're playing cards and dancing and having a great time, the Indians, who regarded this rock as sacred to them, as a full moon, came and found them there, uh, what do you do when you find white people there? You, you massacre them. I mean, they're desecrating your rock. So they jumped out of the woods and killed about half of them. And uh, there's a place there, Levi Jackson Park. Uh, there's a cemetery and a little museum there and everything else. So th this is kind of fascinating that somewhere, the Chickamauga Indians, the Cherokees, you know, Judas ancestors, and mine used to kill each other. <laughs> and hopefully we're part of the healing of that whole, that whole thing. <laughs> so my topic this morning is, is a really key topic, and uh, Alice's testimony fits into it. But there are a whole variety of different kinds of healing that God wants to do in our lives. Every part of us needs to be healed. And even those groups that discovered Healing tend to think of it as physical healing. The big healing services are mostly physical healing. But it's so much deeper, like the kind of healing that Alice talked about. It's a deep spiritual inner healing, isn't it? And again, you start to get emotional about this. We're not doing it. People are out there Sunday suffering from these things, these fears, and whatever we do on Sunday doesn't touch these things. 
And it's estimated, for instance, that about one-fourth of young American women have been sexually abused. And you don't get over this by willpower and by repenting. Something else has to take place as God's healing power. And th this surprised me when I found this out. About one out of five or one out of six men, young men, have been sexually abused. And again, where does this get dealt with? Now, the wonderful thing, you see, what you're learning here, see, this can't be dealt with even at a healing service, a large healing service. Uh, you're not coming up and standing in front of a group of 400 people and saying, you know, my father incested me. Whatever, you don't do that. And so it has to be private. It has to be one-on-one -on -one or in a small group, doesn't it? With somebody you really trust who's not going to talk about this. And where you feel comfortable like you can open up and share it. Now, the wonderful thing, see, is that you're not just learning to do healing services, but how to minister, you know, in a small group or one-on-one -on -one or four-on-one -on -one or whatever. And I would like to uh, start this morning with uh, Matthew 8, 16. That evening they brought him many who were possessed by devils. He cast out the spirits with a word and cured all who were sick. This was to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. He took our sicknesses away and carried our diseases for us. So this is something that Jesus did upon the cross. And yet, until recently, I never heard a sermon about the cross and that Jesus took our sickness. You know, it's always he took our sins, which is true, but our sins include something much more than things that I purposely did that were wrong. It's that, but it's much more. It's all the sin, th things that have to do with sin that are upon me as part of the human race, a broken human race. And so the good news, we're discovering this, the good news is what Jesus has done has been a lot more than we ever thought. A lot more. And we're opening this up and discovering how much more this is. And so the title of this talk is Four Kinds of Healing. Actually, there are more, but these are the four main talks in the simple areas. And this is simply based on who we are as human beings and the different levels of our humanity that are wounded and hurt and touched. And the first is our, our bodies are touched. They're wounded. They're hurting. And this is part of what Jesus came to give you know, it says this here. It's right after, he, uh, in context, Jesus has just healed three different people, three different physical healings. Then said, this is to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. This is physical healing. And our bodies are badly wounded, and this is all one of the effects of the fall. Now, some of the things that Jesus is going to do for us are in this life and some wait till the next life. And I think it's important to know that, but even in this life, you see, all the way to heaven is heaven. And even in this life, God is doing these things. Like uh, Judith in her life has received three major physical healings. Now at some point, uh, we go to be with the Lord <laughs> And uh, maybe we'll pray for healing at that point, and it, it, it won't be the time. But she's had three major healings. For instance, before I really knew her, uh, I prayed for her because she had a precancerous condition, and her, her doctor wanted to do a hysterectomy. On a scale of one to five, she was four, so they wanted to you know, prevent any... any uh, uh, cancer developing and going to the rest of her body. So they wanted to schedule a hysterectomy. The day before she was being examined by her doctor, uh, one of her friends asked, uh, asked me to pray for her. 
If all four of us prayed for Judith, the next day she went in to see the doctor, and he said, you're healed. The doctor said it. And she was stunned. She sat up on the side of the bed. She didn't know what to do. She was supposed to go home. And uh, he came by the room again a little while later and said, what are you doing here? And she, she was stunned. And the doctor said, you've been healed. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, if that hadn't happened, you see, if she'd had a hysterectomy, we wouldn't have two children. I mean, these things have significant effects, don't they? And so it's so important that we understand that this is part of the atonement. This is part of what Jesus came to give. And our sin is not just our personal sin, but it's the effects of sin. The second level where we need healing is emotional. Almost everyone has difficulty somewhere in the emotional order. Fear is one common thing, and you don't get rid of fear just by saying, I don't want fear. I rebuke you, fear. You know. And this is, oh, you, you feel like yelling at somebody, but you don't, no, it's not like some villain took this away. Uh, Satan, I guess, took it away over the course of centuries. But just for instance, Iraq, the war in Iraq, men coming back from the war in Iraq. And many of them, like one out of seven, they estimate, are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And you, you come back and you, you can see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and that's helpful. You can see a counselor. But if you've been subjected to violence and you can't sleep at night, we, we met one veteran of the Vietnam War who hadn't been able to sleep for 30 years. 30 years! And he's a committed Christian. It doesn't do any good just to say, I want to sleep. And to know, you see, does our nation know that Jesus can do something for the veterans? It's interesting, too, that uh, Sunday night, uh, a series begins, a week-long series of Ken Burns on the Second World War. And the effects of the war, that's what he's interested in, the effects of the war on the men who served. I, I served in the Second World War. I, w I wasn't in combat. I served in the medics. But a lot happened to those men. And we see, see it as the good war because... Unless we had gone to war, uh, you know, Hitler would have taken over. England probably would have been invaded. So in a sense, it was a good war. But 400,000 Americans died. And now, th this is shocking. Uh, many young people think that the war was fought. The Germans and the Americans were on one side and the Russians on the other. I mean, they don't even know what it was all about. We served. People don't know what it was all about. I mean, this is the history of the human race, isn't it? But all the things that happen to people in the emotional order, some people are afraid, some people are angry. You know, all the emotions, this is part of the tradition, Christian tradition, that the emotions are disordered frequently, and you don't get them in order just by willpower. And the the third area is the area of the spirit, or the soul. And uh, I came to this late, you know, mostly what we do in preaching is telling people, you know, here is the ideal, this is what you can live. Uh, we want you to live, make a firm purpose of will with God's grace and do it. This is what Paul says about that. <laughs> This is so strong. This is in the seventh chapter of Romans, uh, towards the end of the chapter. The fact is, I know of nothing good living in me, living, that is, in my unspiritual self. For though the will to do what is good is in me, the performance is not. 
with the result instead of doing the good things I want to do, I carry out the sinful things I do not want. When I act against my will then, it's not my true self doing it, but sin which lives in me. And so here's Paul saying, we got this great ideal. I have this great ideal. <laughs> I got the ideal, but I don't have it in me to live it. The ideal is good. I know the ideal is good, but I don't live it. On the other hand, I know what I shouldn't do, and I do it anyway. And most of the seventh chapter of Romans is Paul saying, this is our human condition. What are we going to do? The seventh chapter of Romans is our human condition before the Spirit gets hold of us. The eighth chapter is what happened when the Spirit comes. And at the end of the seventh chapter, Paul cries out, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to Jesus Christ, my Lord. And so I found out kind of late in life that it, it's good to give a sermon on what we should be doing. And it's good to give a sermon on what we shouldn't be doing. <laughs> but you're just making people feel guilty if you don't pray along with the sermon. Alcoholics discovered this, didn't, didn't they? Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. I, I don't want to drink, maybe, but that's addiction. I drink anyway. And if you preach a sermon on drinking to alcoholics, pretty soon they leave the church because they can't do it. They feel failure. I can't do it. And AA, I think it's wonderful that the, the people who discovered AA were Christians and they were lay people, laymen. And they found they couldn't do it. And they, the, the principles are very Christian. The, I need a power higher than I am. I need to admit that I'm doing the wrong thing. Now I can't do it. I have to admit it that I'm down here. And then I have to turn to a power higher than I am and they found that that works. But we didn't do it. And I've heard sermons, it makes me angry because some of the, the ministers who preach in this way fail themselves. But don't tell me, this is the way they, they preach, don't tell me <laughs> that this isn't sin. <laughs> don't tell me this isn't sin, it is sin. Admit it's sin. Come down here. Get on your knees. Admit that it's sin. Well, it is sin. But the very nature of addiction is you, you can't help it at some level. What you can help is to admit, I can't do it, and turn to a power higher than I am. And turn to that power and then turn to other people who will help me. You know, I can call them any hour of the day or night and they'll help. So all these areas are areas which affect the whole, our whole nation. Like it, it gets you, like our nation, our, our nation. Our city of Jacksonville, uh, we're in the Bible Belt. Seventy percent of the marriages in Jacksonville end up in divorce. The number of divorces among Christians is about equal than the number of divorces among people at large. And you say, how can this be? No, we can understand reasons for divorce and so forth. It's not universal. There are good reasons. But to say that 70% of Christians end up in the divorce court, no, something is missing. There's got to be something more, you see, on every level of our being. Now, I'd like to say something a little bit about uh, oh, the fourth kind of healing. It's different because the cause is different and the cause is demonic. If the cause is demonic, then you need a different kind of prayer, which is a prayer of deliverance. But the demonic can affect my body, spirits of infirmity, can affect my emotions, spirits of fear, whatever. 
they, they can affect my, my spirit, spirits of sin. And this gets you to, basically in the Christian church today, this is not being taught. I was just reading last night, it really uh, bothered me, because I love the books of Bishop Tom Wright, who's an Anglican bishop, he's highly respected. Every Easter he's on television defending the resurrection, you know, against the people who are voting on whether it happened or not. He's great. He has three huge books, 700 pages long. I've read two of them on the resurrection. But I read last night in his latest book of, about the problem of evil. And he has the contemporary theological attitude that Satan is just a kind of a construct for something else uh, in our society, just a, a mindset and so forth. And Satan isn't real. And we confront Satan almost every day in a very real way. I mean, it's not just a theoretical. Our estimate, for instance, is, uh, and you've heard Judith, she's a psychiatrist, a psychologist, I'm, I'm sorry, a counselor. And her estimate, from years of seeing people, 40 years of seeing people, is about one out of three need deliverance from evil spirits. Now, they're not possessed, you know, understand. It's something much less than possession. But they, they are affected, and the spirits are in the person. And they affect the people out there on Sunday. If this is true, and we had <laughs> this is a typical Sunday audience, for instance, and one out of three of you needed deliverance, there's going to be an oppression upon the group unless we get at this, you see. So I didn't know that Bishop Wright believed that. And he's just echoing what almost all believe today. Um, Barclay, William Barclay, I, I, I like his commentaries on Scripture. I see people nodding. Every Baptist bookstore you go into, you find uh, shelves of Barclay. <laughs> he's the most popular commentator on Scripture. And he says, now he's the last generation, you know. He says that uh, in Jesus' day, they thought a lot of sickness was caused by demons like epilepsy, and maybe some is caused by demons. But he, he said, oh, that's the way they saw things in a primitive way, in a superstitious way, that's what they thought back then. And so you get a charismatic figure like Jesus, who people believe in, and people come to Jesus and he says to the supposed demon, be gone, the person, because of the power of suggestion, is freed, and they think it was demonic. But we know better. This is Barclay. Check him out. He's in every Christian bookstore across the country, and he's good. I like his books. But they don't believe. And so, as far as I'm concerned, there are thousands of people who are oppressed who could be freed, and they're not being freed because we don't understand. And there is such a thing as a power of suggestion. You don't want to deny that. I had a, a good Jewish friend, and every year I'd come back to town, and we have our annual religious discussion. And after I found out about Jesus healing people, I thought he'd be interested. He was. He's very interested. And his response, we were eating at a, at a restaurant, and he and his wife and I, so I told him about Jesus healing people. I thought this would really get him. And he said, well, come on, Francis. Come on. He said, you're a charismatic figure. And people think when they come up in line that they're going to be healed. And we all know that 30% of them are going to get better. We all know that. So how is what you do different from just being a charismatic figure? So I, what, what I did, <laughs> there, there's some things that could be the power of suggestion, but other things are well beyond. Uh, this is a great story. His daughter, who is in college, 
Uh, she's about 20 years old, really bright, you know, open to anything. Could be the Maharishi or anything. She's, all, she's open to anything. But she'd been in an automobile accident, and she was really hurt. They put a, a steel plate in her femur or something like that. So that, that had happened to her, but she was still limping. And so I suggested to Bob, I said, where, where is, uh, where's your daughter, Laurie? And he said, oh, she's out tonight in a Greek restaurant with her grandparents. I said, well, suppose uh, we all get together and we pray for her and see what happens. Uh, now, Je Jesus, as you know, the people he prayed for were not Christian, most of them. So, no, I, I don't do that lightly. I mean, I, I was praying for five minutes before I said, let's go, because you just don't do that. So we all gathered at the place, Merton House in St. Louis. We gathered, and there, there was Bud and his wife, Marilyn, and Lori, the three of them. Lori was in the center. And I told them, I didn't give them a long sermon, but I said, if anything happens, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. So they said, fine, you know, that's your, that's your thing. <laughs> we'll see what happens. So we prayed, and something really happened. Her old leg started shaking, and Bud said, stop that. <laughs> and then she got up, and she ran across the room, and then she went out on the street and ran up and down the street. I mean, something really happened. Now, the things that we've seen happen are, are now not all of them. Some of them could be explained by the power of suggestion, perhaps, but... Major things happen. And I'd like to say about physical healing, uh, most of what we see as improvement is not total healing, but it's improvement. In my book, if we can pray long enough with a person, and usually we don't have a chance to pray long enough. We pray long, if we pray again, <laughs> keep praying. Uh, finally, the healing will, will, will take place. But it doesn't always take place. And just to give you an idea, now this is our ministry, it may not be true of everyone's ministry, but we have a meeting every year in Rutland, Vermont. We meet in the Holiday Inn. We have a capacity at the Holiday Inn, it's 460. We have that every year for three days, and we've had it since 1983. So we've got to know the group, it's wonderful. Some of you, few of you have been there, I think. And... Uh, they do a lot of praying in small groups, wonderful group. And uh, at the end, we have, we have individual testimonies, but we have kind of a group testimony, like in these three days, and I want you to be really honest. Uh, how many of you would say you have been totally healed? How many have been improved? How many re received a significant inner healing in some area of your life? And how many received deliverance? So typically, uh, out of the 460, there might be three or four totally healed. Now that's a small percentage. How many of you have been improved? It's usually around 50. How many have received a significant inner healing in some area of your life? It goes way up, like two-thirds of the group have received a significant inner healing in this three days. How many of you received a deliverance from evil spirits? That's usually around 50, some area of your life. Now, I, I think this indicates what God really wants to do. You know, he's so eager uh, with a physical ailment, you can still be in great shape inside, can't you? But with an inner ailment, it's harder. And he's so eager to help people on the inside, you know, the kind of thing that you were talking about. He's so, he's, he's just waiting. And the sad thing is there's a, there's a prejudice out there among some Christians against inner healing. A real prejudice. And some, some Christians, thank God they're open to deliverance from evil spirits. And I, I've known some of them, and 
been at conferences with them. <laughs> They're great people. But they don't like inner healing. They say it's depending on psychology or something else, you know. And I find personally, and I just ask you to check this out and see in your ministry if this isn't true. God is more eager <laughs> to do this. I, I think it ha personally, I think it has something to do with the masculine and the feminine, like a Deliverance appeals to, to men, typically, you know. In the name of Jesus, you know, get out. You know. <laughs> and uh, inner healing is much more nurturing and maternal and the mother holding a little child who, who's hurting, you know. Your testimony, you know, scared, needing to be held. And the wonderful thing is that even Jesus, or I shouldn't say even, that's a put down to Jesus, but Jesus is very eager to hold people. And a lot of the time when we pray for inner healing, uh, Jesus appears to the person, holds them. And it's amazing what he does. And Judith is going to be speaking about inner healing. But we find healing on every level. Wherever you're hurting, especially if it's impairing your life with God and your life with other people and relationships, there, there's so many people in our society, like the, these marriages that are busting up where we live, where it's a Christian city in the Bible Belt, as it were. Ask how many of them are saved, probably of that 70%, you know, most of them would say they're saved. And it's no different between them and the non-Christians. That, that's the tragedy. There's something wrong. And the something wrong is people don't understand the power of the Spirit, how it could touch them so that they can relate to one another. <laughs> like, it's such a blessing to me to be married to Judith. You know, we, we pray every morning. We pray every evening. That's the first and last things we do. Together we pray, and we discover that apparently most Christians who are married don't pray with each other. And it's missing. No wonder, no wonder. And so the, the wonderful good news that I want to share with you is that uh, Jesus hears our prayers on every level. The, the emotional, the willpower, if you can't quit, dr quit drinking, Let's pray about it. Yeah. I, just to tell you another story. The, the, uh, this was a woman who was an alcoholic, a long-time alcoholic. Uh, they were a wealthy family. Uh, the family had paid for her to go to Guest House, which is a, a number one facility in this country, Michigan, to deal with alcoholics. You know, the best of treatment. And she'd been there and didn't do a bit of good. In fact, when she came back home, uh, when she tried to quit drinking, uh, she was such a mess and so angry and blow off the handle that her husband decided it's better to let her drink. It's better for the family to let her drink. And a couple of her friends uh, talked her into coming to see me. This is when I, before I married, when I lived in St. Louis. And... Uh, so uh, she came with her two friends to see me. And uh, she had to take a couple of good stiff drinks to get, to, to get in the car to come see me. I mean, this is the way it was. This is, this is our humanity, isn't it? I mean, this is the, the history of the human race. Anyway, she, uh, she came and I prayed. It was a very simple prayer that Jesus would free her from this addiction, from this need to drink. And she quit. And I haven't been in touch with her recently, but it lasted, uh, lasted for years. And the amazing thing about it was, after that, God took care of it so deeply that she didn't even have problems with it. Most people still have problems, but she could go through the grocery store, pass the wine, and it wouldn't even bother. She could walk right down the aisle and was like, didn't even bother her. Now, 
God can do that. And the sad thing, you see, bishops and district superintendents and ministers don't know this. If you have a problem with drinking, uh, come to church. No, not to the whole church, but uh, come to us. And the, the minister's job as we see it, because uh, there's so many things a minister has to do. Uh, I figured out seven things ministers have to do, and no one person has all those gifts. So you've got to spread it out. And the best thing to do is uh, kind of like what we do at Christian Healing Ministries. Uh, the minister, like this used to be me, now it's Judith, and now it's Leanne Ramar. But you find people with gifts, with talent. You're a talent scout. And you don't look like this happened to so many people in the healing ministry. Uh, the, their extent was getting a good music minister. Or like Catherine Kuhlman got a director of uh, ushers. You know, Ma Maggie was her name. She was so famous. Director of ushers. All, all these other things. But th there's only one person up there who's the healer. You see. But our job is to be a talent scout and not just find people who can help you, but take the risk of finding people who are better than you are. And the, the chances are <laughs> that there are a certain number of people here that God could use more than, than he's used me. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, there could be, certainly. Why not? So, we have to defer to one another, like John the Baptist, you know. Uh, he, he, he increases, and I have to get out of the way. I have to get out of the way for Judith. And that doesn't happen even in the healing ministry. Where, where do you find someone who's bringing up someone to take their place, you see? It's always somebody in the family, if there's anybody else at all. Like, I rem I'm, I'm not talking down somebody if this is just the way things are. But Catherine Kuhlman, a fascinating purpose, a per person, and she, uh, she had this big ministry in Pittsburgh and then traveling around the country and on television and so forth, and all of that. And she typically get the ministers up. She loved to get the ministers up on the platform. And then she'd pray for them, and they'd be slain in the spirit, you know. But I, I remember the first time I met her really personally. I, I was in the crowd, but she found out I was out there. Not, not that I was known, but I was a priest, and I was in collar. And she'd grab people like that, get the ushers to get. So she got an usher to get me and bring me up on the platform and all of this. And there'd be some point in there, and she'd have the 20 ministers up there say, God chose me, a little girl from Concordia, Missouri, to bring the healing ministry back. And he had to go to Concordia, Missouri to find a little girl like me because you, you know, <laughs> are not doing your job. Were any of you present at any of those days? I mean, you'd say, oh. <laughs> But when she died, there was nobody there that she trained. There are a number of people who said, I, I think I got her mantle, like Benny Hinn. But there, were, there weren't people that she selected to train, you see. What we want to do is to get the whole church going. So this is not an extraordinary thing. This is something going every place. And where you find people in your congregation, your school, where, wherever it is, uh, and you gather them together and some have more of a gift, say, of inner healing, and others have a gift of deliverance. Uh, and you find out others have a gift of discerning spirits. Like uh, uh, on our teams, I, I love to I gather a team. And of course, Judith works with me, and uh, she has a gift of knowing what's wrong with people, even though they don't say it. So we're going down the line. This is not ideal because you, you don't have time to deal with all these crowds, but you do what you can. But we're going down the line, praying with people, and then she'll peel off. And uh, I, 
expect this from time to time. She'll peel off and then she'll come back five minutes later and she'll tell me later that this woman, for instance, uh, had an abortion. And she didn't say it. But God told Judith and God ministered to her and she dealt with it. So it's good to select people, you know, who can stand by your side and be present and say, like, uh, one of my gifts is being, uh, this doesn't sound like a gift, but I'm relatively, relatively oblivious to what's going on around me. <laughs> like, I can go to, into a meeting and uh, I'm thinking of some real specific examples and uh, Judith and friends will say, wow, did, did you feel that evil in that room tonight? That, that church, that, did you feel that? Say, no, what, what was it? T tell me. <laughs> so, uh, now if I'd known, I probably would have been wiped out. And people are sensitive to these things. It's like the, the canary in the coal mine, you know? They, they get overcome because they're sensitive. And because I'm not sensitive, in a, in a sense, I'm not sensitive, you know, uh, I can survive. And, um, I can drop it at night and I can sleep at night. And people who are sensitive are still wrestling with this, praying all night long. And that's a gift. So the flip side of our gift is often our weakness. And it's wonderful to surround yourself with people who have gifts you don't have. And I don't know how many of you go way back to the days of Jack Benny and Fred Allen and the radio people. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, Ed Sullivan, you know, the Beatles came to this country and Ed Sullivan had them on his show and all of that. This is way back, 1950, early television, black and white. And he, 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 you know, he stood like this and talked like this and he was all tied up. And somebody asked Fred Allen, who was a great comic, said, how come Ed Sullivan has lasted all these years? And Fred Allen said, He'll last as long as anybody else has talent. Now, that's my motto. <laughs> I'm a talent scout. And you find somebody, and usually they don't even know, like uh, they, they have a gift of, of talking. It'd be great to get them up to speak. And they kind of begin slow, and gradually they gain confidence. Like, when I first began, this is probably hard for you to believe, but Judith wasn't a speaker. Now, I didn't know. But as soon as you hear her, you know, she's got talent. And I had to encourage her, you know, you, you, can, you can talk. <laughs> and then she would talk, and it just gradually developed. And this is the way it is. You, you need to encourage people, usually. They're, we're all proud, but... And usually our pride goes on the sense I don't want to be embarrassed. Uh, I just as soon sit in the back and listen to somebody else talk. You have to encourage people. So I think the minister should be a talent scout finding people who can pray for deliverance, for inner healing, for physical healing, for spiritual healing. And some people have discernment. You can put them on the team. They don't even have to pray. They just tell you what it is. Now, this is something you see. This is why it's so encouraging to be speaking in a seminary. Because this is where it has to really begin. Where people have the time to learn. Because there's so many things to learn in this ministry. The, the basic thing is simple. You know, you pray for healing. I mean, you learn to do that. You can do it. But there Difficult things like satanic ritual abuse, the effects of that and the person is dissociative identity disorder and multiple personalities. Now, that's something not everybody should get into. But what you need, where you are, whether you're just out there without any ministry, as far as you know right now, you should know somebody in your area. If something happens where you need deliverance, you could turn to them, you can make them Make a phone call, make an appointment. Somebody like Judith, who's a counselor who understands uh, people's psyche and 
the things that go into that, you know, you can deal with that. Uh, you need to know who these people are in your area, in your church. It would be wonderful if every pastor had, was surrounded by a, a huge team, really, of people that could free everybody in the congregation. Wouldn't that be great as an ideal? Now, we, we thought it would be good if we had maybe 15 minutes to discuss some of these things and answer any questions you have. You should have some questions. And uh, we're not intimidated. Yes? Could you say that again? Yeah. Talk about there are times in people's lives when they don't get the cure, but there's healing that takes place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said uh, the cure would be the total healing, but some healing takes place. Uh, as I said, you know, some people get healed and some people die. And that is very hard in our humanity. And everyone we pray for is not healed. As, as we, like a member of our staff right now has medically uh, incurable cancer. And he's starting six months of chemo and radiation treatment. Now, the prognosis is very dim. But on the other hand, we've seen a lot of people who are healed. So what we do is we try to get the discernment on how to pray. And if there comes a time for the person to die where it's not working, we're there with them. Just to give you an example of this, because uh, we don't expect everybody to be healed. Uh, in this life, you see, it's some this life, some the next. But I was asked, this is when I was in St. Louis before I married, uh, I was asked to come uh, to the Children's Hospital, Cardinal Glennon Hospital in St. Louis. There's a little girl who had, I think it was kidney failure, and... Uh, the prognosis was very dim. And so I, w I went into the intensive care unit. There were four kids in the intensive care unit. I went in for this girl, and I prayed a little bit for the other three, because I was there and they were there. They, they were all healed. The, the one I went in to pray for was not physically healed. But after that time, she began to see Jesus. She'd see him sitting in a corner, <laughs> reading a comic book. Uh, uh, <laughs> really. Uh, finally, they sent her home, because there was a limit to what they could do in the hospital. They sent her home to die. And when she went out, um, out of this life, that is, uh, she heard angels singing. And her parents had quit going to church. They were Catholic. They dropped out of church. Her death was so significant that they came back to the Lord. So her death was redemptive. And, of course, we all die. Uh, and uh, my, my dearest friend, I think, uh, in, the fifth, the, in the 60s and 70s, Tommy Tyson, the Methodist evangelist, I was present and prayed for at least three areas, major healing, where he's totally healed. But at the end of his life, it was just there was too much. All the systems started failing. So it, it's a question. I know not everybody is healed physically, but I trust that something happens. Like Judith said last night, everyone we pray for, something happens. And I would like it to be said that everyone we pray for is blessed. No one is harmed through our ministry. That would be our ideal. No one is harmed, and everyone is blessed and gets closer to the Lord. I don't know if that helps, but I don't expect everyone to receive a cure. Paul Allen, uh, MDev student uh, on the Methodist track. Um, how do you identify, discern, or diagnose demonic oppression? Okay. I have a book on that. 
uh, <clears throat> deliverance from evil spirits? So that's a very good, very good question. Uh, the, the first way is people will tell you. Now, usually they don't tell anybody because they're afraid even the pastor will think you're nuts. And uh, so I, I don't say this, but a significant number of people uh, are aware something is wrong. Now, th this is interesting. Let's just take this group. Uh, a lot of time, uh, people, now we all know that there's evil in the world and all of that, but a personal evil, a number of people have experienced something which is personal, like uh, something that comes into the room at night and they're frightened and there's a big presence and they can't move. Or whether, uh, all kinds of things like that happen. Uh, but they don't tell anybody. Now, th this is interesting. How many of you, this isn't to test you, but to get the sense of the group, how many of you would say that you've really encountered in some way a really personal evil? Could, could you raise your hands? Look at that. It's about 50%. Now, th so the first way is people sense something is wrong, but they don't tell anybody. And th this is fascinating because uh, my ancestors were Presbyterian, Scotch-Irish, Presbyterian. I uh, like the people of Magnet Massacre. <laughs> and uh, we were invited, I think it was 2001, this is extraordinary, we were invited by the Church of Scotland that's the Presbyterian Church in Edinburgh, the headquarters. And Judith and I were invited to bring a team to speak on deliverance from evil spirits, a weekend for clergy in Edinburgh. Now, the, the reason they invited us, one of the things that uh, uh, John Calvin, the famous John Calvin, who was their you know, mentor, as it were, he felt healing, prayer for healing, was a papist superstition. So the Presbyterian attitude towards Catholics was pretty dim. But that they would ask us to come and talk about evil was extraordinary. And what happened was every year, I think there were 1,400 pastors in Scotland, and they'd ask the 1,400, what would you like talks on this year? And of the 1,400, significant number had parishioners people from their congregations who came and said, something's in my house, you know, ghost, or something's going on in my house. What do I do? And that wasn't part of their tradition, what you did. So they figured Catholics might know something about that. So we, we had an incredible time over there in Scotland. Uh, Leanne, who's here, uh, she was there. She saw it. And um, we ended up with... Uh, we were in a room kind of like this, and we talked to the, to the clergy. It wasn't a huge number. I think about 70 or 80, something like that. We, we had a little deliverance right on the platform. Extraordinary thing. And uh, so we, we were invited to do this. <laughs> and it was interesting because uh, we met with the, uh, some big group of leaders over there. Not a big group, but... Ten prominent leaders. One didn't believe it at all. And he had been educated in the United States. Others really believed in it, and they all wanted to learn. It was fascinating. But a significant number of people, the first sign is that they've experienced something, and they feel something was wrong. They don't know what it is, and they want to talk about it. Other times... Uh, when you pray, especially pray with the power of the Spirit, uh, the things can't stand it, and they're flushed. As it were, you're just praying with this person, the normal person asking for headaches or whatever, and while you're praying, suddenly the person changes. They change. It's no longer this person. And they say, we hate you! So where's the we come from? And how can they hate me? I... I haven't been there yet, you know. Uh, it, it happens with, with the power of the Spirit, flushes them out. That's another way that it happens. And uh, like 
in our, I think it's level one or level two uh, training, we, we had a man from England, outstanding Christian, who was in charge of a big ministry. So these things glommed on to him in his ministry. He wasn't aware anything was wrong. He just came to our level one to learn about how to pray for healing. So we asked for volunteers, as we often do. Uh, let's get somebody right from the group, and we'll pray. We'll show you how, how he, here's how you can pray. So we invited him up front, and uh, as, as we started praying for his physical ailment, I think he had a bad back or something, suddenly he was doing this thing that we associate with uh, the spirits. He was bending over, retching, going like this. So we were in the middle of a deliverance. We didn't expect it. And he was freed right there. And it was a, we, we changed the teaching uh, to deliverance. <laughs> and uh, afterwards, he sent him up to Judah's office to recover. And uh, the, the relationship between all these things is very important, especially between inner healing and physical healing. And whatever happens to us in the inner order, like... The most dangerous time in a man's life is when his wife dies. The year after that, uh, something in you, you know, your fight, your desire to live, uh, goes. Like, well, things like that happen. I, I think it would be good we could show it here if we could get uh, uh, somebody to volunteer. Um, maybe one of the... the uh, Young women who was praying, would, would you be willing to volunteer? Come on up. This is real simple. Uh, why don't you come on up here? Just to show the relation of the physical and the... Uh, I'm going to ask her to do uh, a couple of simple things, really simple. I'll, I'll just ask, and don't do it yet, just to hold her arms up and uh, to think of something really wonderful one of the happiest moments of her life. She doesn't have to tell us anything. But in her mind, she's thinking of a really happy thing in her life. It could be years ago, it could be today. And I'll push down on one of her arms, and you resist. Don't, don't let me push. Okay. Then I'll ask you to think about something really sad in your life. And again, you don't have to tell us what it is. Just think it. And I'll push. Okay? Okay. Just think for a minute what the two would be. I have my happy thoughts. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Now just hold one arm up one. or both. You could do both. And I'll, I'll push down. Now, now don't let me push down. Oh, she's pretty strong. I'm really pushing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's the, see, she... See, there's a lot of resistance there. It's hard to push it down. Now, the, now think of the unhappy thing. Have you got that? Mm -hmm. Okay, hold your arm out. Now think of it. She's still strong, but it went down easier. And our emotions have this effect on us. If we're thinking sad thoughts all day, uh, the immune system was weakened. And our ability to fight the stuff off that and germs and everything else, it's lessened. So it's a wonderful thing to be a Christian and think happy thoughts. Dr. Harold Koenig teaches at Duke and does a lot of studies on aging process. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, he, sa he says that studies show that uh, ardent Christians live seven years longer on an average than ordinary. And that's a really good... Uh, not, that's not charismatic Christians or anything that are just good Christians. So this affects our, our, our health and everything. Just one more, and then Judith comes. One, one quick one. You say that uh, not all are healed. In our prayer ministry, we do have a, a section we call the long term, mm -hmm. and some of them, our question is how long do you pray for someone who say, say MS or these chronic diseases, mm. do we just keep them on the list in, uh, indefinitely, or is there, you know, it's been a, sort of my partner and I run the prayer ministry, and we, this has been sort of what we've been wondering about. 
And that's another great question. Uh, how long do you keep praying? One thing you don't want to do is kind of torment the person by praying uh, like they feel like they're failures, like you've been praying for me for a year and I haven't done anything, I haven't measured up to what you're trying to do. So there's a tendency to feel kind of guilty doing this. Uh, I would say, uh, pray as long as it seems to help and ask the Lord, should I keep praying or should I stop? But uh, people can be tormented by, especially people getting words that were really from themselves because they wanted the person healed and say, you're going to be healed. Uh, we had this just last week at the center. Somebody came in, and not one of our staff that came in and was saying, uh, we've prayed for you. This was, wasn't really under our authority. And they're good people. And they came and said, you're healed. And then the next day, he was to face a decision whether he wanted chemo or not. Now, in that situation, if you believe this person, taking chemo is a sign of a lack of faith. So you put him in a really difficult dilemma. Does he take whatever medically is available, or does he turn it down because of a lack of faith? I mean, uh, how, how we approach things has a real effect. And uh, that's why we like to work in teams. And uh, if one of us is excessive or whatever, people will tell us. Th that's a good question. I would say, uh, pray is like, oh, this is one of the good things about praying in tongues. Uh, one of the reasons for praying in tongues for healing is you don't have to figure out what to pray. You know, Am I praying for healing for the six months, you know, nothing is happening. But I, I just pray in tongues, and my understanding is I'm asking God just to fill this person with his life and his goodness. And I'm not trying to figure everything out. It's one of the great uh, blessings of praying in tongues is you don't have to figure everything out. Turn it over to the Spirit who knows what's going on, and the Spirit can pray through me for whatever it is. Thank you, that was a good question. They're all good.